hello and welcome to another java tutorial in this tutorial i'm going to continue our discussion on java native interface and look at the oracle's uh, java documentation or the official oracle's documentation on java native interface and this is for jdk 8 but i think it's, it would be very similar to the jdk's that uh, come after jdk 8. on the left side here i have all my lectures on the JNI and as as I walk you through the Oracle's documentation, I also point you to the relevant uh, uh, locations in the documentations of my lectures that you can find more information about the topics. So if you go to the uh, content page, you see we have uh, the, the Oracle documentation is divided into five uh, chapters. Chapter 1 is Introduction, Chapter 2 is Design Overview, Chapter 3 is JNI Types and Data Structures. Uh, these are the topics that we discuss, like the strings, and then uh, primitive types, reference types, JNI functions, all the functions to access fields, methods, uh, throwing exceptions, and then uh, uh, other object operations, like creating new objects and uh, different calls string operations array operations and the last one is invocation api this is something that we rarely use when we develop jni applications that's because these are more about uh, invoking a vm a actual vm or creating an actual vm in c plus plus however we looked at these two important top uh, functions jni unload and on un unload unload is when the jvm loads a dynamic uh, library it looks for this symbol jni unload if it finds it it tries to execute the function so it assumes that this symbol corresponds to a function pointer and tries to execute that pointer and we saw that how to take advantage of that to get rid of the refactoring problem that we have when we develop jni uh, uh, applications all right, back to the top. Let's start with the introduction. In the and let me go backwards. So in the introduction, we the first topic is Java Native Interface Overview, and then the historical background, the objectives, Java Native Interface approach, programming to the JNI, and the changes that came in JDK eight compared to JDK seven or six. Right. So introduction. This chapter introduces the Java Native Interface, JNI. The JNI is a native programming interface, which means it allows you to program uh, some stuff in C++ or C, the native language of the operating system. And then uh, uh, JVM has a way of calling those functions or whatever code that we write in uh, the native language. It allows Java code that runs inside a Java virtual machine, VM, to interoperate with applications and libraries written in other programming languages such as C, C++, Assembly, and also Fortran. So we also saw how to use Fortran because Fortran, so uh, using Fortran language, we saw that uh, for C++, we use uh, basically uh, GCC, G++. For Fortran, in macOS, we use GFortran, and we, we saw that G, basically Fortran also compiles to the native binaries of the operating system, right? And uh, therefore, we can uh, call the Fortran functions in C or C++. And because we can call them in C++, we can use JNI to also call them. Anything that we can call in C++, we can use JNI to call them also in Java, right? And uh, if you... Uh, uh, if you want to refresh your memory on how we uh, use the Fortran and called Fortran libraries in Java, you can go back and review my lectures on Fortran and how to use it with JNI. Obviously, assembly is the same thing. So C, C++, assembly, Fortran, all of these languages that uh, compile directly to the binary format of the operating system, of basically the native programming, uh, we can call them with JNI. The most important benefit of the JNI is that it imposes no restrictions on the implementation of the underlying Java VM, right? Therefore, Java VM vendors can add support for the JNI without affecting other parts of VM. So this JNI is more or less like a, uh, basically uh, a black. So J, we, all know, we know that the JVM uh, treats the uh, native functions, basically all these native business as a black box. 
So JIT, the just-in-time compiler, doesn't even go close and doesn't try to touch these. So like native methods don't get uh, JIT compiled. Now, there are uh, some efforts. I think in JDK 15, 16, they will try to somehow develop something separate from the Java native interface. And I think it's going to be like native linker or foreign linker, something like that. And that allows uh, basically every implementation of this whole native interface business. And that allows the JVM to actually JIT compile even the native code. So VM has some sort of awareness. At the moment with JNI, the JVM doesn't have any awareness of what's going on in the native code because all the, J the JVM understands is there's a dynamic library, it has some binaries and that contains some symbol bindings to basically the native methods in Java and you can call them, right? So Java VM vendors can support the, for the, can add support for the JNI without affecting other parts of the VM. Programmers can write one version of a native application or library and expect it to work with all Java VMs supporting the JNI. So, I mean, obviously it's not a mandatory part of the JVM, which means, <clears throat> or mandatory part of Java, which means some vendor of the VM might opt out of having support for JNI, but nobody does that because everybody just forks the original uh, open JDK repositories and it automatically has the JNI support anyways. So this chapter covers uh, the following topics. First, Java native interface overview, historical background, JDK 1.0 native method interface, a Java runtime interface, raw native interface, and the Java com interface, and then objectives, Java native interface approach, programming to the JNI, and then the changes. So Java native interface overview. While you can write applications entirely in Java, sometimes we really need to have some sort of uh, access to the lower level libraries that are available natively in the operating system. There are situations where Java alone does not meet the needs of your application. Programmers use the JNI to write Java native methods, right? So we write native methods. We add the native methods to your class and compile it with Java compiler into class file, right? These are native methods to handle those situations when an application cannot be written entirely in Java. The following examples illustrate when you need to use Java native interface. The standard Java class library does not support the platform dependent feature. So this is one important uh, reason that we go native platform dependent features for example accessing to the STD IO right the console IO and uh, we covered this in uh, when we talked about the native resources or how to handle uh, me memory leaks native resources resource management we saw that we always use try with resources we never use or we we shouldn't use finalize there because it's deprecated and then uh, we saw how to deal with a standard IO, right? So uh, STDC in, STDC out, these are the basically direct handlers of the console input output natively. And uh, obviously Java cannot directly communicate with the console. It has to go native through native uh, API that the operating system provides. That's why we use the native, uh, uh, we create an example console in and then we added lots of native methods to call these um, functions or methods of the standard scene and standard CR. So we go native whenever we want to give, uh, get to the, some of the native features that we cannot directly get with Java. Obviously in this case, in this example, in my lecture, I mean, uh, Java has system.out.println uh, and system.in. So Java provides a way that uh, we can directly interact with console in Java. And uh, if you go look at the, how those system.in and system.out are implemented, they're just native, right? Obviously, it has to be native. There is no other way. A virtual machine has to go through native calls to talk to the operating system or talk to the hardware. So when we try to implement a file reader, we said that this, this means we need to talk to the hardware and the only way to talk to the hardware is go through the operating system, which means we have to do native calls. So platform dependent features needed by the application. You already have a library written in another language and wish to make it accessible to Java code through GNI. And a prominent example is uh, GSL, GNU Scientific Library. 
and we saw that GSL is a massive, massive uh, uh, library of uh, mathematical functions, scientific functions, and uh, it's written in C. We can use it in C++, and we said that uh, uh, for the example that we had was every function. Let's say I want to calculate every functions in Java. Instead of trying to figure out how to implement it in Java, I just create a native method that calls the uh, every function of the GSL in the uh, a special function namespace, right? So that's much easier to do, right? Obviously, then uh, our call or code becomes platform dependent. That's because we're using native libraries. But then if we compile this GSL on different platforms, we can always check in Java which platform to choose, right? So if I go to, we, ha we had a discussion on the multi-platform uh, multi jars. And then uh, we said that, uh, uh, let's see if I can find it, how to check the platform. So in the platform, the way we check for the platform to, all we need to do to make sure that our Java code still becomes uh, platform independent is two step, right? The first step, we have to compile our native C++ or C code on different platforms and have them available to Java as dynamic libraries, right? So we have to have, the, we have, to have a dynamic library for each operating system. I mean, operating system is not the definition of platform. Platform means the CPU instruction set plus the interface that the operating system provides. So platform is a combination of uh, operating system and the CPU architecture. Could be x86, x64, 64-bit or ARM, for example, right? And we said that we use the system property of Java, os.name, and then we check it if it's Windows, Mac, Linux, Solaris, and we can also check if it's 32-bit, it's uh, uh, os.arc, A-R-C-H, and then uh, we can check if it's uh, uh, basically uh, if it's 32-bit or 64-bit, here's another uh, one of my lectures here, platform independent jar. We have to create uh, separate dynamic libraries for the native part, and then we check the platform, CPU, and operating system. OS.name gives us the name of the operating system, and then for the CPU, we need to check the architecture, so OS.architecture. If we want to also restrict the versions of the operating system, let's say on macOS there are some features, native features that we're trying to use in Java, and those weren't introduced in macOS 10.9. They were they were only introduced in 10.10 .10 and later. So we can also check for the OS dot version, and we saw examples. So OS dot name, OS dot architecture, and OS dot version. These are the important parts to make so that we take advantage of these to make our Java build platform independent, even if we use native calls, right? So the third one, you want to implement a small portion of time critical code in a lower level language such as assembly. And again, Java is not a good choice for time critical code, for fast code, right? Java puts the most emphasis on the readability and maintain maintainability. So Java is all about big projects that have hundreds or thousands of small classes, like 10, kilo, 10 by 10, 10 kilobyte, 20 kilobyte of class files, and uh, maintainability and readability, right? But it's therefore it's not fast. When you run the JVM, it has to compile a lot of stuff to just uh, boot, go through the bootstrap classes, and that takes time. So Java is not by design f the fastest. Uh, uh, programming language. By programming through the Jena, you can use native methods to create, inspect, and update Java objects, including arrays of strings, and we've seen how to do that. Call Java methods, we've seen how to do that. Catch and throw exceptions, we have seen how to do that. So uh, basically, catch exceptions, exception occurred, exception check, exception, exception check, this kind of stuff. Let me just quickly bring it on. So exceptions 
Java exceptions in C++ and we saw that there are four main methods in, uh, in JNI that we can use these four functions exception clear tells JVM that we handle the exception in C++ exception check checks any if any exception occurred exception describe just prints the stack trace and exception occurred gives us a object handle j throwable handle to inspect more if we want to call any particular method inside that uh, exception right catch and throw exceptions load classes and obtain class informations we use it with the find class on the class path that's the main uh, point entry point to accessing or loading a class on the class path in c++ perform runtime type checking and uh, this is the via the reflection is instance of so working with generics is instance one example was working with generics because in generics uh, at the compile time the compiler tries to deduce the most generic type so for example in this function or in this method t print info native ti so t doesn't have any bounds upper bound or lower bound so the compiler just deduces java object right but then if we pass an integer object or a string object then in c++ because this is native we have to figure what type it is right because strings in c++ are different from the primitive types so we use one of the functions is instance of and then uh, also JNI has some uh, reflection related functions from reflected method so we can send a java lang reflect method to c++ from reflected field to reflected method to reflected field get super class if we want to we have a j object and we want to get a super class is assignable from this is for checking cast just like in java we can the compiler checks if a cast a explicit cast that we're doing on objects is a valid cast or not this is the same story is assignable from all right so perform runtime type checking or type casting yeah you can also use jni with the invocation api to uh, enable an arbitrary native application to embed the java vm and again this is not something that we typically use that's why i didn't really put any lectures on this topic this allows programmers to easily make their existing applications java enabled without having to link with the vm source code right so historical background uh, vm virtual machines from different vendors offer different native method interfaces these different interfaces force programmers to produce maintain and disrupt multiple versions of native method libraries on a given platform we briefly examine some of the native method interfaces jdk1 native method interface netscapes java runtime interface and if you open up the jni.h in your jdk you see that in the header it has a comment that it's actually an extended version of the original netscapes java runtime interface so netscape when it adopted java and wanted to enable java in their uh, browser they try to create this in native interface so that they can interact with java and microsoft also developed another version microsoft's raw native interface and java com interface jdk 1.0 native method interface jdk 1 was shipped with a native method interface unfortunately there were two major reasons that uh, this interface was unsuitable for adoption by other Java VMs. First, the native code accessed uh, fields in Java objects as members of C structures, right? So it accessed the uh, fields in Java objects as uh, members of C structures. However, the Java language specification does not define how objects are laid out in memory it's uh, vm dependent if a java vm lays out objects differently remember a c a, a struct in c or c plus plus is a flat uh, memory layout right whatever you have in whatever order it's exactly the same thing in the memory if uh, but here it says that the J J J J jls java language specifications actually doesn't define or doesn't provide any specifications of how the objects are laid out in the memory so it's vm dependent and if something is vm dependent <clears throat> going from one vm to another might break your code if a java vm lays out objects differently in memory then the programmer would have to recompile the native method libraries right or you might even you might need something more than just recompile you might need to 
change some stuff in your code. Second, JDK 1.0's native method interface relied on a conservative garbage collector. And again, this garbage collector is a painful topic when we go native because Java has to deal with this annoying uh, garbage collection in the background. The unrestricted use of the on-hand micro, for example, made it unnecessary to conservatively scan the native stack. And again, this is problematic in general. Java Runtime Interface <clears throat> Netscape had proposed the Java Runtime Interface, JRI, a general interface for services provided in the Java Virtual Machine. JRI was designed with portability in mind. It makes few assumptions about the implementation details in the underlying uh, Java VM. The JRI, JRI addressed a wide range of issues, including native methods, debugging, reflection, embedding, invocation, and so on. Raw native interface and Java COM interface, the Microsoft Java VM supports two native method interfaces. So Microsoft is also a vendor of the Java VM, right? They have their own Java virtual machine implementation. At the low level, it provides an effective raw native interface, RNI. This is not JNI, this is RNI, raw native interface. RNI offers a high degree of source level backward compatibility with the JDK's native method interface, although it has one major difference. Instead of relying on conservative garbage collection, the native code must use RNI functions to interact explicitly with the garbage collector. So it disables garbage collector, which is good because it speeds up the native calls, right? However, then you have to manually interact with this garbage collector. If you create any local local objects in uh, local Java objects in your C++, then you have to manually delete them. At a higher level, Microsoft Java COM interface offers a language independent standard binary interface to the Java VM. Java code can use a COM object as if it were a Java object. A Java class can also be exposed to the rest of the system as a COM class. All right, so objectives of the Java native interface. We believe that uh, a uniform, well thought out standard interface offers the following benefits for everyone. Each VM vendor can support a large body of native code. Tool builders will not have to maintain different kinds of native method interfaces. Application programmers will be able to write one version of their native code and this version will run on different VMs, right? So it's a uh, VM independent. The best way to achieve a standard native method interface is to invoke, involve all parties with uh, an interest in Java VMs. Therefore, we organize a series of discussions among the Java licensees on the design of a uniform native method interface. It is clear from the discussions that the standard native method interface must satisfy the following requirements. Binary compatibility. The primary goal is binary compatibility of native method libraries across all Java VM implementation on a given platform. Programmers should maintain only one version of their native method library for a given platform. Efficiency. To support time critical code, the native method interface must impose little overhead, like uh, in the order of maybe tens or twenties of uh, CPU cycles. All known techniques to ensure VM independent and thus binary compatibility carry a certain amount of overhead. And again, the, the painful thing is uh, VM has to create some safeguards when it goes from Java to uh, native call. And then uh, garbage collection is another painful thing to deal with. We must somehow strike a compromise between efficiency and VM independence. Functionality. The interface must expose enough Java VM internals to allow native methods to accomplish useful tasks, right? Java native interface approach. We hoped to adopt one of the existing approaches as a standard interface. And again, if you look at the jni.h header file, you see that it has a comment at the top that saying that their start point is actually the Netscape's uh, uh, native interface runtime because this would have imposed the least burden on programmers who had to learn multiple interfaces in different VMs. Unfortunately, no existing solutions are completely satisfactory in achieving our goals. Netscape's JRI is the closest to what we envision as a portable native method interface and was used as the starting point of our design, right? 
Re readers familiar with the JRI will notice the similarities in the API naming convention, the use of method and field IDs, the use of local and global references, and so on. Despite our best efforts, however, the JNI is not binary compatible with the JRI. So if you compile your native uh, code to create a dynamic library with JRI, and then uh, it's not compatible with the JNI call. And although a VM can support both JRI and JNI. Microsoft RNI was an improvement over JDK because it solved the problem of native methods working with a non-conservative garbage collector. The RNI, however, was not suitable as a VM-independent native method interface. Like the JDK, RNI native methods access Java objects as C-strikes, leading to two problems. Obviously, the first one is the memory layout. RNI exposes the layout of internal Java objects to the native code, which can be dangerous. Direct access of Java objects as C-strikes makes it impossible to efficiently incorporate right barriers which are necessary in advanced garbage collection algorithms. So again, GC, the garbage collector, and all these safeguards, right barriers, these are all uh, painful things that we try to go from Java world to a native world. And eventually we have to make a compromise between all of these issues. As a binary standard, COM ensures uh, complete binary compatibility across different VMs. Invoking a COM method, uh, requires only an indirect call which carries little overhead. In addition, COM objects are a great improvement over dynamic linked libraries in solving versioning problems. Right. The use of COM as a standard Java native method interface, however, is hampered by a few factors. First, the Java COM interface lacks certain desired functions such as accessing private fields and raising general exceptions, right? Uh, obviously, JNI in its uh, current format allows us to access private fields. It allows us unrestricted access to the meta space of the VM, which is great. Second, the uh, Java COM interface automatically provides the standard I unknown and I dispatch COM interfaces for Java objects so that native code can access public methods and fields. Unfortunately, I dispatch interface does not deal with, uh, with overloaded Java methods and is case insensitive in matching method names, which is bad because Java is case sensitive, so all the method names can be case sensitive. Furthermore, all Java methods exposed through the I dispatch interface are wrapped to perform dynamic type checking and coercion. This is because the iDispatch interface is designed with weakly typed language such as BASIC in mind. Third, instead of dealing with individual low-level functions, COM is designed to allow software components, including full-fledged applications, to work to together. We believe that it is not appropriate to treat all Java classes or low-level native methods as software components. Fourth, the immediate adoption of COM is hampered by the lack of its support in uh, Unix platforms because Microsoft's VM was Windows specific, obviously. Uh, also, Java objects are not exposed to the native code as COM objects. The JNI interface itself is binary compatible with COM, which is good news if you're still into, if you're using Microsoft VM. JNI uses the same jump table structure and calling convention that COM does. This means that as soon as, uh, as, soon as cross-platform support for COM is available, the JNI can become a COM interface to the Java VM. JNI is not believed to be the only native method interface supported by a given Java VM. A standard interface benefits uh, programmers who would like to load their native code libraries into different Java VMs. In some cases, the programmer may have to use a lower-level VM-specific interface to achieve top efficiency. And again, the goal of JNI was not to be super efficient. It was it was meant to be a basically a standard uh, native interface for Java. Might not be the most efficient way, but uh, it's at least a standard that everyone can adhere to that standard. If you want more uh, performance out of your native uh, programming, you might need uh, access to a lower level VM specific interface to achieve top efficiency. In other cases, the programmer might use a higher level interface to build software components. Indeed, as the Java environment and component software technologies become more mature, native methods will gradually lose their significance. Right. 
Programming to GNI. Native method programmers should program to the GNI, and that's because it's a, a standard that everyone can use, and it comes shipped with the it ships with the JDK, right? It comes with the JDK. Programming to the GNI insulates you from unknowns such as the vendor's VM that the end user might be running. By conforming to the GNI standard, you will give a native library the best chance to run in a given Java VM. So it's vendor independent. It can run on all VMs, right? If you are implementing a Java VM, you should implement the GNI. GNI has been time tested and ensured to not impose any overhead or restrictions on your VM implementation, including object representation, garbage collection scheme, and so on. Please send us your feedback if you run into any problems we may have overlooked. Changes. As of JDK or Java 6 standard edition, the deprecated structures JDK 1.1 uh, init args and JDK 1.1 attach args have been removed. And again, these two functions are for invoking a VM inside the native call have been removed instead java vm init args and java vm attach args are to be used all right and again we rarely use this when we're developing jena applications that's just because the main stream the main stream use of jena is just uh, call uh, native functions that we have na use native libraries in our java code so i hope you enjoyed this lecture please stay tuned and i'll see you in the next one